give it a go if that's fine with you hey should we go uh, yeah i think so great then uh, can i please ask everybody to mute their microphone as we will be starting now uh, the broadcasting online can also start so I'm really extremely pleased to uh, welcome you all to the sixth uh, web dialogue organized by the Parliamentary Assembly of the OSC. This initiative aims at promoting interparliamentary exchanges on relevant security developments pertaining to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's event is an initiative by Dr. Heidi Fry, mm -hmm. MP from Canada and OSC's PA Special Representative on Gender Issues, who will lead this online seminar focusing on the multiple gender-related implications of the COVID-19 crisis. The 2020 OSC EPA Gender Report was published last week. You should have received an electronic copy already, and my colleagues uh, will make sure that you receive the link to this report in the chat later on. Please also join me in welcoming our high-level speakers. Um, Dr. Fry will be followed by Mr. George Serratelli, the OSC EPA President, to be followed by Mrs. Gabriela cuevas Paron the IPU president and our guest of honor today. And we are particularly pleased to further contribute to interparliamentary dialogue with our IPU counterpart. Our Secretary General, Roberto Montella, is also with us today. Grazie mille, caro Segretario Generale. And I thank our two expert speakers, Mrs. Inge Bjord Gisladotir, uh, who is the Director of the OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the ODIR, and Mrs. Françoise Girard, who is the President of the International Women's Health Coalition. Thank you for being with us uh, to contribute to this online policy debate with your valuable insights. In order to leave the time for the discussion of substance, I will limit myself to very few technical details on the proceedings of the seminar. Please note that this web dialogue is being recorded and broadcasted live on the USCPA's Facebook page and website. So there are many more connections also online. And as for previous web dialogues, English, French, Russian interpretation will be provided during the event. Please note that uh, listening to the interpretation requires a separate device. All of you should have received information on how to connect to the Interprefy service. If not, please let us know in the WebEx chat function visible on the right hand side of your screen and our team will offer necessary support. The token for today's event is OSC PA webinar. It will appear uh, again in the chat now. I'm also showing this paper for all of those who might be connected uh, via Facebook, for instance, or our website and who might not actually have access to the chat. So this is Interprefy, you have to download the app and this is the token you have to enter once you log in. Uh, to facilitate the work of our interpreters, please try to speak as clearly and slowly as possible. Please inform us and please reconfirm that you want to be a speaker for this debate, even if this was already uh, indicated when registering. It is necessary to register now by requesting to take the floor in writing in the web dialogues chat. Please specify the language of your intervention. English, Russian, uh, or uh, French, which will be followed and noted down by my colleagues here with me in Vienna. And to ensure a smooth experience, I ask all the participants to kindly mute their microphones when not speaking. Uh, we hear some uh, background noise now already. Uh, the administrator of this platform may also need to mute the microphones if necessary to make sure that only the person who is given the floor is unmuted. I apologize in advance if this was rendered necessary. Uh, please bear in mind that you should unmute your microphone before speaking and only when given the floor. Finally, I would kindly re request to all the speakers in the debate to limit their intervention to a maximum of three minutes, thereby en enabling a greater participation and the timely conclusion of the event by uh, 18 o'clock Central European time. Uh, in approximately almost two hours from now. Dr. Fry has given us very clear instructions on time management, and this will be applied very strictly and equally to all participants. You will hear a gong uh, when your time is over and tolerance for overtime will be minimal. Without transition, it's time to dive into today's topic, starting from the Pacific Ocean with our special representative on gender, Dr. Fry, who is joining us from Vancouver, Canada, which has the reputation of being the most Western OSC location. 
she will be followed by our OCPA president, George Seretelli, and by the IPU president, Gabriela Cuevas Baron, followed by our secretary general, Roberto Montella, to greet all the participants before we hear from our two experts. The Honorable Dr. Fry uh, was first elected to Parliament from, uh, for Vancouver Centre in 1993. She was re-elected each time since then, and she's now the longest serving female MP in Canadian history. She held, amongst others, the post of Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health, and she was Canada's Secretary of State for Multiculturalism and Status of Women. Dr. Fry, thank you for bringing today's topic on the agenda. Dr. Fry, you have the floor. afternoon for you and I just wanted to say hello and thank you for coming on to this webinar because I think it's really very important in this crisis for us to, to discuss exactly what the impact of COVID has been on gender or the gendered impact of COVID as we like to call it. I, um, it, uh, I want to congratulate all of us who have cared about gender that this is the 25th year of the Beijing in 1995, the Beijing conference. It's also the 20th year where we had agreed on women, peace and security in the United Nations 1325. Um, uh, it's great to say, now I wanted to say you have the report. It's very long. So I'm not going to read, on, uh, uh, read the report at all. But I just want, I hope you've read it because I'm just going to touch on some of the things in it. I don't want to really be very long at all. I, I wanted to say that we have made gains. You all know who've been following it, that we have made gains uh, since 1995. But it seems as if every time we make two steps forward, we take one back again because we continue to be to find that we are regressing now and then. And so we find that in some parts of the region of the OSCE, that we do have women's rights and sexual and reproductive health, specifically some of their human rights, some of the equality of opportunity. We find that that has been rolled back in some countries. And we hope that we can work to make this happen, to make this change. And maybe, and perhaps, because COVID-19 has been a crisis and a pandemic, Perhaps out of it will come something good. Perhaps out of it, we will look at a different way of creating a new post-COVID world that will be able to look at equality for all. Uh, all of those people who are unequal because of gender. And by that, I also just do not mean men and women. I mean the fact that we now know that gender is not binary. And so we need to talk about trans persons and the intersectionality of women who are, as we're seeing in the U United States of America right now, women who, because of the color of their skin, are facing violence. There, so there are racial components to gender. There are indigenous status components to gender. There are um, uh, ethnic components to gender. And so we need to always, every time we talk about gender, we need to be able to have the good, solid, disaggregated data that will tell us not only the, the gender of the person, but that would also look at some of the intersectional uh, areas in which women are still, and men actually are still being found to be unequal because of different components. And so we've talked a little bit about how we've made few gains and some rollback in terms of, of uh, Beijing. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you know, COVID-19 has exposed a great deal of cracks in our own personal infrastructure here in Canada. And I know around the world, countries are noting that suddenly we are seeing vulnerable persons who have become more vulnerable and more at risk as a result of this whole pandemic. And, and a group that has become more at risk turn out to be women, actually, and persons whose got all of those intersectional areas that we talked about in terms of their ability to, to function because of their gender. We know, all of us here, that women are amongst the poorest in the world, that poverty wears a feminine face. We know that, in fact, the discrimination in some countries against gender, uh, on the basis of gender, and especially if you're a woman, uh, created large uh, quantities of violence against women, both societal and domestic. 
we know that in fact, um, because uh, women are in fact amongst the poorest, they struggle with economic uh, opportunity. And, and so we know that already, but COVID has exposed us even more so. And I just wanted to say that, that if we look at what COVID has done, and I wanted to talk about one area, and that's of course violence, um, gender-based violence. We know the data is showing us that whenever there's a crisis, either a pandemic or, or conflict or some other reason, that in fact the increased amount, women bear the brunt of that increased violence, both at home, domestically. I mean, normally we know that in Eastern Europe, for instance, in the OSCE region, 70% of women uh, by the age of 15 and onward can say that they have faced violence, both domestically and in some way, whether it is re violence the physically or uh, intimidation or all of the psychological points of violence that women face. But and we also know that now that we have a, a pandemic in, in Sierra Leone, for, for instance, in 2004, when Ebola came, it was found that, in fact, the the amount of violence against women increased by about 20% to 25%. And we're hearing this now around the OSCP region in France, in, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, here in Canada. We are hearing more and more women calling out for help, um, especially when they are at home. And if they face domestic violence, they actually are now isolated with their abuser. And so there is a real problem here because <clears throat> women don't know what to do because they're locked into the house. And in fact, we find that, that it is a powerlessness in the face of a crisis like a pandemic that causes anxiety, causes anger, and to lash out and to blame someone. And so generally speaking, women and children face the brunt of that anger when they're in isolation at home. Now we know that it's very difficult because while in some areas, uh, the increase in the number of helpline calls have increased. We found that in some areas it's decreased and we wonder and we have to ask the question, has it decreased because people are afraid to call out because they're afraid to use the telephone. They're afraid for someone to know that they're asking for help. And so actually around the world, what, what has come about is a way of asking for help. For instance, like we are on this webinar right now. And if I were concerned and I were worried about violence, there is something that I can do. I can put my hand up like this. I can fold my thumb into it and I can bring my fingers down. And if I do that, anyone looking would know that I'm asking for help, that I am facing uh, violent or threatening situations within my home. So I think this is one of the things we need to look at because it's happening greatly and it's taking the form of racism and it's taking the form of societal violence as well. I know that in Canada, we have found that racism, not just against uh, women, but we have found that racism against the Chinese are, are increasing because everyone seems to want to blame China for the problem. So we, we, we need to look at that and we need to put that into perspective. Then we have access to services. We know that, that access to services, actually more men seem to get the virus, more men seem to die from COVID-19. But what we do know is that women are the ones on the front lines. They're, they're based in precarious work situations. They're caregivers, they're caretakers. They're the ones who, who are the janitors in the hospitals. They're the ones who are caregivers for, for parents at home. They're the ones who are uh, caregivers for all their children who have in some instances stayed at home in lockdown. So women are under a great deal of stress. And of course, because they're working in precarious situations, in some areas, they don't even have proper uh, personal protective equipment. And so they are facing, and then they go home and they take the, the virus at home with them. So this is something we should know. Women who are migrants are facing increased violence. It's been shown, uh, it's been documented, and we're hearing more and more of this, that women are at risk of trafficking now, uh, trans persons uh, and children are at risk of trafficking during COVID-19 because they are because they do not have access to money and to economic assistance. Uh, many of them are forced into precarious work again into sex trades because it's the only way they can survive and get food on the table and keep a roof over their heads. So we're now seeing all of this exposure happening. We know too that because again women are among supporters and women tend to still uh, work in low-paid jobs. 
uh, we find that we know when, when COVID-19 is over and as we rebuild a new economic era and try to find jobs, that there aren't going to be all the jobs. And we know that women are not going to be hired as much as men uh, because of, again, their inability to find work and to be at the lowest rung of, rung of the ladder and to work in these low wage jobs. So there is the economic problem that we need to look at. And of course, uh, we want to talk about women in conflict areas. Women in conflict areas are in fact greatly exposed. We've heard that the number of calls coming out of Ukraine right now are huge, that women are facing violence in a, in a great way in places like Ukraine. And we find that there is again, the idea that the Secretary General of the United Nations has said that we should all face the common enemy, which is COVID-19, put aside conflict because what it does is divide us. And I know that the OSCPA has echoed this over and over. And we do have quite a few conflict zones in the OSCPA that we need to look at. And so finally, I just wanted to talk then about the fact that we talked about the crisis. We've talked about the cracks in our systems that have been exposed because of this crisis. Um, but, you know, the, the Chinese have a saying that um, the word crisis has two sides to it. One is danger and the other is opportunity. And I wanted to close by saying now that we've exposed what we've always known and found that it worsens in crisis, we also know that this is not going to be our last pandemic. Uh, globalization has created this ability for pandemics to become very rapid. And so we know that as we rebuild and that as we look at rebuilding economic, uh, social and uh, all the infrastructure that we need to, to rebuild, that we need to change the way we do things. We need to strengthen the infrastructure. We need to start collecting disaggregated data based on gender and the intersectionality of gender and we need therefore to plug these in because given that we depend so much on women during the times of pandemic we need to make sure that when the next pandemic comes or even as we rebuild that we rebuild stronger systems systems that will allow for women to take their true place and and move forward and because of that i just want to add just a little plug here for the fact that when we look at leadership it's kind of interesting to see that the seven countries that have handled COVID-19 extremely well happen to be headed by women. Uh, we look at Germany, we look at Taiwan, we look at New Zealand, we look at Denmark, Finland, Iceland, and Norway. They all have female leaders and no one knows why. And this is worth some research for the researchers in the crowd. We need to tunnel down and find out. Is it because women have a tendency to look at the world with more compassion? Is it because women have a tendency to look at problems in a more multifactorial way so that they are trying to bring about all the changes that need that they need and not just one? Or is it because they're more cautious and therefore take a problem like COVID and, and actually try to follow the public health guidelines? I don't know what the reasons are, but I think that it is good to note that these seven countries are leading the world in dealing with this issue. Thank you for listening to me. And I would like to turn the the, the microphone over to George Seratelli. Um, I don't know if Mark will introduce George or if I should, but I don't think George Seratelli, the president of the OSCEPA, needs any introduction. Uh, George, we all know, is passionate. He is always ready to elbow and to take a, a shoulder all of the issues and all of the problems. He has an ability to understand all of those problems. And he, he has an ability to deal with them all in the same way. Is it because he was a neurologist? I don't know. Uh, is it just because he's a very good politician? I don't know. But the first time I met George Seratelli was at a um, EPF conference, which is the European Fund for Population and Development. And he was out there banging the table in favor. He was, I think he was president of the group at the time, banging the favor and table of women's access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. That was how I first met George Saratelli. He's continued to be a very strong supporter of gender equality. He's continued to move forward in that. So I'll give you George. Thank you very much, Dr. Fry. Absolutely, uh, as your SCPA president, 
join us from BDC Georgia. Uh, thank you for being with us, Mr. President. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Today, um, I, I don't know, you hear me or not? Uh, that's always a, just a second. Just we a hear second. you loud and clear, Mr. President. <laughs> okay, very good. This is always the first question when you have this type of meeting. Uh, thank you very much, dear Haley, for your introductory remarks. And uh, I'm always uh, uh, emphasizing your, your great inputs, you know, our gender mainstreaming activities. And thank you for recalling times when we met first time and it was uh, the, the issue, the matter you already mentioned, gender equality and the reproductive rights and sexual rights and all the fundamental rights that uh, uh, women and girls should enjoy. Uh, and then those years uh, when I contributed to this issue, you know, beyond OSCE, they were very precious for me. And also I gained a lot of expertise. And I'm always also telling you that you are one of the leaders who inspired me over the, over the years. And we're looking at you and looking at uh, some other leaders who are joining us today, we're more than convinced that uh, uh, women are great leaders and they can do great things. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope, uh, of course, that you all who are with us today, uh, you are doing well and uh, we all in our country slowly and, and hopefully safely returning to some form of normalcy. Uh, I'm very happy that we have today um, our special guest, uh, Gabriela Cuevas Baron, President of, Inter of the Interparliamentary Union, uh, also very passionate uh, politician and um, also very happy that we established great cooperation with personally with her, with this institution, me, the Secretary General. Very recently, they have a uh, very interesting webinar, and I know that our Vice President, Margaret Sandler, participated uh, on, uh, on uh, issues of. Uh, how, how we can achieve SDGs and what a, what a pandemic Im impact on SDGs, realization of this huge and a very ambitious plan. So let me also greet our esteemed uh, guest speakers today, our very good friend and great partner, uh, Director of ODIR, Gidor uh, Gislatopir, always pleasure, and she's participating in many, many our uh, event events, and we too. So that's uh, uh, part of our virtual work in those difficult times. And uh, Ms. Uh, Francois Girard, uh, President of the International Women's, uh, Women's Health Coalition. So our pleasure and thank you again. Of course, we all look forward to hearing their thoughts and expertise uh, on the topic of the day. I hope that we can use their recommendations uh, to promote the participation of more women, or more young people, or more minorities in our work within the OSC uh, uh, and in our own countries. Uh, again, I'm uh, very much thankful to uh, Dr. Heidi Fry for hosting this webinar, it was her initiative, and for presenting uh, uh, her annual gender balance report, uh, where all our work and also recommendations are reflected. Uh, she's a really pioneer when it comes to high quality work on gender issues within the OSC. And I'm very glad that we have been able to continue holding these discussions online so that uh, we may debate this important topic <coughs> also. Of course, uh, we are all we are highly disappointed that we will not be able to see you in Vancouver uh, next month for our annual session. I think all the team and well, we're looking forward to getting to know your uh, the great uh, city, uh, although I've been there a few times and uh, it's really a great place. Um, but regardless of how COVID uh, has impacted our plans, we must continue to promote gender equality across the all the OEC region. And COVID itself provides an opportunity to analyze gender inequality from new perspectives. Um, although COVID has changed many things in our daily lives, providing equal opportunities remains uh, an essential step to foster peace, sustainable democracy, and, and economic development. Uh, and, and much uh, like other issues uh, we have already discussed in our webinars and the previous ones, uh, armed conflicts, climate change, human rights, uh, the situation will not magically get better 
without politicians and leaders being proactive. Uh, the pandemic has revealed many inequalities, maybe Jeff, uh, hey, you already outlined the main major ones. But studies have shown that in general, men are more likely to die from COVID-19 than women. Uh, meanwhile, women make up uh, a higher proportion of medical and nursing staff, and they have found themselves on the front line of the COVID health response. Also, with a large proportion of the workforce uh, urged to work from home and children not being able to attend school, it has been very delicate for many families to balance parental and home duties with work. Uh, fortunately, we have also seen increased reports of gender-based violence in many countries and many regions. Women and men, uh, also living in refugee camps or conflict zones, are especially vulnerable to COVID-19 and other diseases as a result of living in overcrowded conditions, a lack of sanitation, lack of access to decent health care and vaccination programs. Um, physical distancing and permanent hand washing are simply impossible in many cases. And we got this information also in our previous webinars on migration or in conflicts. Uh, pregnant refugees and migrants face a higher maternal mortality rate than non migrant women, uh, which may be exacerbated when healthcare services are stretched due to the COVID 19 pandemic. Also, for women and girls, vulnerabilities and home. Uh, on the front lines of healthcare and the labor market that should be, those issues should be addressed. And um, all together, uh, all this compels us to redouble efforts on promoting greater gender equality. This should be an integral part of our response on many fronts. In our economic response, for instance, we must strive to close the gender pay gap. As part of our health response, this also means revalorizing the work of staff in hospitals and nursing homes. Uh, given that COVID-19 for a large part revealed the failure of governance and leadership, perhaps we should also take a serious look at the lack of female voices in decision-making at all levels. And, and I think uh, Heidi uh, very, very well described uh, this, uh, let's say, this uh, idea. Uh, more diversity in our debates of course, is a very good thing. And it ensures that the decisions that are taken have been confronted to multiply points of view. This is also true for OECP itself. We need more women as a part of our delegations, more women as a leading our delegations and being, of course, elected uh, to positions of leadership. I hope we can draw today on experiences of Ms. Baron, uh, Gabriela, and uh, our efforts to encourage the participation of women in political life. And uh, with that uh, being said, let me, uh, I'm not always doing that because it's true. We have to thank our staff, uh, in particular now Marco, Gustavo, Elias, and Anya, and of course Roberto, who is always uh, with us um, uh, on our events and initiating many of them. And uh, thank you for your great help in organizing also today's webinar. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Uh, thank you for your global and multi-thematic approaches of the issue and for your leadership in uh, dealing with uh, gender issues. I will now turn um, to our IPU president, Mrs. Cuevas Baron, who is a Mexican MP. She has been in politics for the last 20 years, and she is the chairperson of the Foreign Relations Committee, which is responsible for the analysis of Mexico's foreign policy. She is the 29th president of the Interparliamentary Union. Mrs. Cuevas Baron, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful invitation. For me, it's great to be with you. Uh, I would like to thank you first, uh, George Serenity. It's uh, wonderful to be with you again, and now, IPU and the OSCE are true partners. We are working together, we are learning together. So thank you, thank you very much for that wonderful opportunity. I am sure that our organizations are going to have more and more in common. We have expertise in different fields, and I am sure that we are going to be able to exchange our knowledge. I would also like to, to thank uh, Roberto. Roberto, thank you very much because we have a huge coincidence that parliamentarians must be 
at the center of the parliamentary organizations. It is our duty to set a table for their leadership, for their capacity building and training and programs. So I, I love to have these coincidences with you. So thank you very much for this uh, great chance to be together. And uh, of course, I need to mention Margareta. Uh, we just coincided precisely in this webinar that uh, George was mentioning. At the IPU, we are having very, I, I can say, huge expertise when it comes to SDGs and how to make them a reality at the country level. But now we need to find those answers because if we do not understand that we need to fight this pandemic, that we need to end this pandemic, we are never going to achieve SDGs. So thank you, Margareta, for joining us at that uh, webinar. I am sure that we are going to coincide in many other events. Thank you very much. Um, going to the topic, uh, I think we all know that we are facing an unprecedented global crisis. This crisis reveals the strengths and weaknesses of our societies. Both these strengths and weaknesses have a strong gender dimension. And parliaments have a key role to play in capitalizing the strengths and addressing weaknesses. Women are the strength of the COVID-19 response by providing essential services and maintaining the social fabric. Women are the majority. Some people say, WHO say that about 70% of the uh, health workers and uh, if we see that in a, in a bigger perspective, we can see that it is not only at the health sector, it is at the cleaning sector, agriculture, catering, uh, women are in the front of the pharmacies and grocery stores. They are more than ever the pillars within their families and communities caring for children and the elderly. But women are also particularly impacted when the crisis uh, during the crisis because of the pre-existing pre gender-based discrimination. Women are more often than men in unstable jobs that are the first ones to go away. We need to understand that, yes, we are now uh, in a health crisis, but we are going to have, almost for sure, an economic crisis. And the most complicated jobs, the smaller salaries, are always dedicated to women. They tend to be left without social protection by working mostly in the informal sector, such as domestic work or agriculture. They do most of the unpaid household and care work, which is on the rise. They have been left in confinement with abusive partners. Uh, I was very surprised last week with, the, with some organizations at a WHO meeting that every day in the world, there are 137 homicides, assassinations of women from their own uh, partners. So we can say that uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? There's like a noise. Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you, of course. Most of these deaths are. Uh, are uh, um, because of the, the partners or closer relatives to, to these women. So we need to understand that gender-based violence is not only in parliaments, as we are studying all the time. It is also part of women's daily lives, and now this confinement is putting women in more and more risk. At the Interparliamentary Union, we have developed a robust plan of action for gender-sensitive parliaments. This should become the roadmap for all parliamentary institutions and leaders for the years to come. In the short term, a gender sensitive parliament is one that ensures equal participation of men and women in the relevant oversight committees that are monitoring and guiding the state's response to the crisis. It is a parliament that ensures women's voice are heard in the discussions that shape our emergency responses and policy priorities one that requests sex disaggregated data and monitoring and requires prior prioritization of the prevention and response to gender-based violence. Women's parliamentary caucuses and gender equality committees can be at the forefront of the inclusion of these gender dimensions within parliament. 
And I would like to put a, a, an accent in an important issue, I think. When it comes to budget committees, women are not that present into those issues, like security or some uh, military areas. But next year is going to be complicated also for budgets. And we need women to be also included in budget allocation in a, in a cross-cutting cross perspective, because that's the only way where we can assure that all policies, all law are going to have gender lens and that women are going to be included even in the most complicated economic circumstances. Also, as a workplace, parliaments must be careful about the specific needs and risks faced by women's staff. Inequalities in the workplace can be exacerbated due to additional care responsibilities that are more borne by women, lower access to IT by women, and increased risk of domestic violence and online violence, which target women in particular. Here, a gender responsive parliament will be particularly careful and exercise a duty of care towards its female employees. Going forward, enhancing women's leadership in particular uh, in Parliament will be a key to, to our success in developing better policies in the future. Yes, we need to give responses for this pandemic right now, but those responses must be also for the future. We need to understand that this crisis is not going to end soon and that Parliament must be key in designing good responses. We know that women in decision making tends to focus on essential goods such as health and education, on the needs of those mostly in need, particularly children, as well as on policy issues that mostly concern women such as domestic violence and reproductive health. Women leaders also be key to lifting persistent gender discrimination in laws that still affect 2.5 billion of women and girls worldwide. I think that sometimes we are assuming that a lot of rights are, are there and, and we can be sure about them, but uh, equality is not there in every single country. And surely there is a, a movement to, to push back against this, uh, this uh, women's rights. So I think that we need to keep in mind these 2.5 billion women and girls that are not enjoying fully their human rights. To succeed, we need to have processes in place to systematically design and review laws, policies and budget through a gender lens. Gender responsive budgeting and income making will be essential in our building back a better strategy, just as the UN Secretary General was saying. This should be embedded in our national laws and institutional frameworks. Gender budgeting includes allocating sufficient resources to protect women from violence and offering affordable childcare facilities, but also making sure that jobs that are mostly occupied by women are adequately remunerated and that women have equal access to digital technology and financial services that are essential to their economic, social and political empowerment. Trying to put all this together, it means building an environment which is going to be friendly for all women and their own development. I also want to stress the importance of rebuilding more resilient societies through inclusive social protection schemes. Countries that have universal health coverage that include everyone in social protection, including those people that are working in the informal sector, that promote shared parental leave for men and women, will be able to avoid many of the weaknesses we are seeing today that affect women disproportionately. At the individual level, as leaders, we must use the media and outreach platforms to challenge existing gender stereotypes and design another social contract. We need to call for better balancing of unpaid household and care work between men and women and show that women in leadership can be the norm, not the exception. This will, be, be, this will help build a better tomorrow for everyone. I would like to only to add on uh, a very, I think a very important lesson, which is why these, uh, these women, as Hedy was saying, that our heads of state are giving good responses. 
And I think that it has a, a perhaps simple but important answer. And it means that they care because they know what they were living before they could enter into politics. It means empathy, it means solidarity, and it means understanding. So I think that's something that we need to, to bring uh, to the same basket. I believe that for us who believe in equality, we need to understand that equality needs both women and men. And we cannot build a more inclusive planet, leaving men aside. So welcome all colleagues, men colleagues, to this uh, very important crusade. I think that this is the moment where we need to work together, to work harder, because the pandemic could be a, a moment to build a better society, but also a moment where many men are threatening to bring women back to their houses. So thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, George, I, I wish that we continue working together. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Presidente Cuevas Baron. Now let me turn to the person who skillfully steered the OSC PS ship during these turbulent times to maintain the vibrant level of dialogue that we know. Secretary General Roberto Montella, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark, for the nice presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fry, for convening this meeting, dear Eddie. This is uh, very much uh, uh, a good opportunity to discuss some of the issues we would have discussed in Vancouver, but unfortunately we cannot do it in person. And uh, thank you, President Gabriel Cuevas Baron, for being with us today. I know uh, how much you appreciate the fact that we put here politicians at the center of the parliamentary assemblies. This is always something that I have uh, several times mentioned to my members. Uh, this uh, assembly belongs to the elected politicians, they are the leaders. And the secretary here is in the service of the, these leaders, uh, and I know that you appreciate that position very much. Um, uh, dear Dr. Fry, dear friends, uh, when men speak on issues of gender, uh, normally they are exposed to two types of mistakes. Uh, either they try to say something nice, to engrace uh, the, the audience, or they venture in some type of uh, philosophical discussions and they go into a very slippery <laughs> terrain. So I will try not to venture in any of these two uh, classical mistakes, also because I want to leave time for our two uh, main speakers, uh, Gisela Todir um, from the ODIR and Francoise Girard, the International Women Health Coalition, who will make presentations soon. Um, but I would rather focus on uh, uh, acts and deeds. I think uh, men who have uh, political responsibility or civil servants uh, like myself who have uh, responsibilities have to uh, speak on these issues rather than with words, with facts and with uh, deeds. So I will just leave you with a few facts uh, before we can actually enter into the debates. Uh, since I took the responsibility as Secretary General, we've hired 10 new staff. Uh, six are women, four are men. Uh, five staff left, uh, five, four men left and one woman left. Um, as far as uh, election observation missions, which is our main flagship of this organization, that's what we normally used to do in the pre-COVID area, uh, we've had uh, 34 election observation missions and uh, our leadership, because it's the leadership that appoints heads of delegations, but upon advice from the Secretary General and the election team, uh, the leadership has appointed uh, 18 uh, uh, heads of delegations women, 14 men. Uh, as far as uh, special coordinators, uh, we are uh, doing a little less good there. We had uh, 10 women and 23 men. And uh, um, last but not least, the special uh, representatives, uh, which are a prerogative of the president, uh, and the president normally appoints special representatives. In the last two years, we've had uh, six out of eight uh, women appointed as uh, special representatives. Uh, so this is just to say that uh, rather than declamate uh, many formulas here, I think uh, I'd rather speak with facts. This is just the beginning of uh, what we're doing. Uh, I hope uh, the best is yet to come, but I think it is work in progress, as you said, and we have to continue on that. Path. So I will leave it very short and I look forward to the presentation of our two guest speakers, but I thank you all and I invite all the women who are in this chat to turn on their camera because uh, we only see few men here and, and the, the women who have spoken, but please, all, at least all the women turn on their cameras uh, so that uh, we can have also uh, your visual presence in the meeting. Thank you very much Dr. Fry, thank you Mark, and I yield back the floor to you. 
Thank you very much, Secretary General. And uh, without further delay, we will now give the floor to our two experts. Uh, first, to Inge Bjord Gisnadotir. She is the director of the well known OSC Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, the ODIR. And she is amongst other, uh, she held amongst other high level posts. Uh, she was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iceland and a senior representative uh, at UN Women. Inge Bjorg, director Gisladotir, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. Uh, before I start speaking, I want to make sure that you can see me and hear me because last time I participated in a webinar uh, organized by PA, you could, you could hear me, but you couldn't see me. So now I, I want to make that sure. <laughs> we hear you loud and clear and we see you also very clearly. Very good. Very good. Uh, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 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 dear friends, it's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be uh, with all of you. Uh, and uh, let me start by, by thanking uh, Heidi Grau, uh, Dr. No, Dr. Uh, Heidi Fry, sorry, <laughs> for, for organizing and initiating uh, this meeting. It is uh, it's really an important topic that we are discussing here and very relevant for, for, the, uh, uh, for this situation. I'm also pleased to see my friend George Seretelli there and uh, Roberto and uh, other familiar faces uh, among the participants. So very pleased to be, be with you. And uh, I would like to start by thanking you warmly for the invitation and uh, also to welcoming our good and continued cooperation with OSE Parliamentary uh, Assembly. That's cooperation that I value very highly. Uh, so it's an honor to contribute to the discussion on the gendered impact of the global health pandemic, which has impacted uh, us, both women and men of all ages and professions. It has greatly affected our social and economic well-being. And, well, you know, we can not only social and economic well-being, but also say mental well-being of, uh, of people. And it has affected our institutions and governments. Uh, responses to COVID-19 have been wide ranging and extensive, although they differ from country to country. What they have in common, though, is that they have had a disproportionate impact on individuals and groups, amplifying inequalities across the uh, OSCE region. The rifts that were already there, existing rifts, have widened during this, uh, this uh, pandemic. And this is particularly true when it comes to safeguarding women's human rights and ensuring inclusive participation. Quarantines, self-isolation, and in some cases, curfews, coupled with economic struggles, work-life imbalance, imbalance unequal distribution of care work, lack of accessibility to public services, have greatly impacted women and contributed to an increase in domestic violence across the OSE region. According to media, cases of reported domestic uh, uh, violence to national helplines and support services have increased, uh, ranging from a rise of 15% up to 120% of uh, registered cases of, uh, of uh, people calling in or women calling in to, to helplines or reaching out to, to shelters. With women and girls being the majority of those who seek services in emergency shelters. OTIR's monitoring, uh, what that's, we are doing now in all the participating states, we are monitoring how the uh, uh, how the uh, emergency situation is implemented. And it indicates a lack of situational prepa preparedness by national governments, which has impacted protection and response measures to tackle the increase of domestic violence. Women from minority backgrounds, including migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, Roma and Sinti, women with disabilities, rural women, Elderly women and those without access to digital technologies have been particularly affected and have found themselves 
extremely vulnerable and even in life-threatening situations. In some cases, first responders from police, judicial and health services have been overwhelmed. In other uh, cases, resources have been reallocated from the criminal justice system towards more immediate public health measures to deal with COVID-19. So that is part of the, of the explanation of the lack of responsiveness, that the resources have been reallocated to other issues that have been felt to be more immediate. Leading to helplines, and this has led to helplines, crisis centers, legal aid and social services being scaled back in the initial phase of the crisis. Furthermore, women have been at the forefront in dealing with the crisis, comprising 70% of healthcare staff globally. And in essential services and the most affected economic sectors. Here, women are disproportionately affected. The commitments are in place. OSE participating states have recognized gender equality as a cornerstone of security and democracy. But more is needed, and I would like to recall the importance of ratifying and implementing the Council of Europe in Istanbul Convention. Here, national parliaments can be a driver of change during crisis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, how we can scale up involvement by our participating states? How can we do that? What is needed to ensure adequate and equal access to judicial remedies, health and social services? The answer is, and this we all know, doesn't come as a surprise, equal and meaningful participation of women and men in decision making. It is key to effective functioning of democratic institutions and policies now more relevant than ever. And I just want to recall the discussion that was uh, or started by uh, Hetty Fry about the seven countries that are most successful in dealing with uh, COVID-19. They are all ha have in common that they are headed by, by women. Uh, I think actually the explanation is not uh, per se that they are women. I think the explanation is that these are genuinely democratic societies. And that's why they are headed by women. That's why women have made it to the top in these societies. So when societies are genuinely democratic and uh, when you have gender equality, not only a lip service to gender equality, but gender equality as a, as a strong uh, factor in all in policy making in these societies, then you see societies that are more prosperous and more equal and more uh, competent to deal with these kinds of, of crises. So I think it all goes hand in hand. Uh, and and uh, to be uh, genuinely uh, equal societies, they need to be genuinely democratic societies. However, I just want to, to mention also that the OTIR analysis has revealed a significant gap in gender balance of COVID-19 task forces across the OSE region. Women are better represented at public health councils and vaccinations advisory groups, but not in related decision making at the political level. So they are, you know, well represented in uh, the bodies that are providing the services, organizing the services, but not at the political level dealing with the, with the crisis. And this can limit the inclusion of gender sensitive policies and perspectives in the COVID-19 recovery strategies. Women's representation in COVID-19 related decision making bodies across the OEC area is low. Let me turn to the role of parliamentarians. National legislative bodies have to ensure the effective uh, oversight of government's response and transparency in adopting emergency uh, legislation. That's the oversight function of the parliamentarians. And it's important to keep governments and parliaments accountable. They need to consider and address the differentiating impact of the crisis and its responses on different groups of society. 
OSCE participating states have committed to reflecting women's perspectives and needs in legislations, policies, and budgets so that protection and services are delivered to all. OT stands ready to assist participating states in integrating gender in their COVID-19 policy response and provide guidance to state bodies working on gender equality. For parliaments, it's important that women's needs resulting from the pandemic are reflected in national gender equality action plans already adopted several in several OSCE participating states. And OD remains at your disposal to provide legal opinions on gender-related legislations, to support gender equality committees and women parliamentary caucuses in assessing equality standards of COVID-19 responses and in preparing recommendations to the government. Our office looks forward to our uh, uh, continued uh, close uh, cooperation uh, uh, with the national parliaments and to provide further assistance to gender equality structures and uh, mechanisms. Uh, let me conclude by offering recommendations from OTIR uh, for participating states consideration. First of all, OEC participating states should take action to integrate gender perspectives in legislation and budget related to emergency uh, planning and uh, prepar preparedness, and revise mechanisms of enforcement where gaps have been reported or identified during the pandemic. This will deliver adequate services, protection, and uh, equitable uh, recovery. Secondly, it is important that parliaments continue to challenge decision-making systems which exclude women. All decision-makers should work to ensure that women's needs and perspectives are adequately uh, reflected in all laws, policies, and measures, particularly in times of crisis. Thirdly, participating states should continue to pay attention to violence against women while determining future course of action related to the COVID-19 public health crisis. Adequate protection and referral mechanisms must be made available for those experiencing violence, regardless of where it takes place. Women's responsibilities are not and should not be limited to our households, our families, our schools and hospitals. Women's meaningful participation is crucial to our societies at all levels, to our democratic processes, parliaments, institutions and security sector. It is our collective duty to ensure that women's needs and priorities are addressed and that their voices are heard in COVID-19 recovery responses across the OSE participating states. And then we all have to have in mind the intersectionality that uh, Hedy also mentioned. Women are not a homogeneous group. Women come from, from different backgrounds and have different needs and interests. So we are talking here about the voices of migrant women, of uh, uh, women from minority groups, of uh, women from uh, all races, all ethnic groups, poor women, the women with disabilities, all the, the voices have to be heard from, from these different groups of, of women. And I think I, I can just stop here and, and thank you again for in, inviting me and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Director Gisla Dortir. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us and thank you particularly for your recommendations. Uh, this is always uh, very much appreciated, very helpful, particularly when you have been uh, underlining the role of MPs uh, in this regard. So now I turn to Mrs. Françoise Girard. Uh, she is the, pres the president of the International Women's Health Coalition. A lawyer by training, she is a long-time advocate and expert on women's health human rights and sexuality, and HIV and AIDS. She is regularly consulted by governments and UN agencies and has been instrumental in ensuring that global frameworks include and further women's rights. Mrs. Gerard, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank the organizers of this webinar for 
uh, making my participation possible today. As we heard uh, from the other speakers, the COVID-19 pandemic has upended life as we know it, and it will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. The pandemic has both highlighted and exacerbated existing health, gender, racial, and economic disparities. Now, these are injustices and disparities that have been with us for a long time, as was noted, and as the current actions and protests in solidarity with black communities and against police violence in those communities are once again making clear. This is not new. And as the virus continues to spread, and it is continuing to spread, the fallout has spanned the globe. The pandemic has revealed the extent to which governments, health systems, and social safety networks were unprepared to respond to the needs of their people worldwide. And this has been especially true, as has been noted, with respect to the health and rights of women and girls. While men appear to be physiologically more susceptible to COVID-19 on every other front, women and girls are bearing the brunt of the pandemic, particularly those from historically marginalized communities, Black women, Indigenous women, LGBTQ plus people, people with disabilities, and others. We at the International Women's Health Coalition work very closely with feminist groups from all over the world. And we heard very early on in the pandemic, directly from our sisters in the movement, what was going on in their country context. Almost from the moment the pandemic hit and lockdowns were imposed, we saw significantly increase, increased rates of domestic violence. Calls to hotlines spiked as women reported being trapped, often with their children, but unable to leave. And with community resources such as sheltered, closed, or repurposed to deal with COVID. In Western Kenya, for example, our partner KMET told us that the local clinic for victims of domestic violence had been, without consultation, turned into a COVID center by the health authorities. They had to push the authorities really hard for the center to reopen for victims of violence. The availability and quality of maternal health care also plummeted around the world. Evidence of the low priority this kind of care occupies in the minds of male, largely male, decision makers. In Uganda, for example, feminist groups described how the shutdown of public transit was preventing women from getting to health centers to deliver their child. No one had thought about the fact that for many women, the cost of private transportation would be prohibitive. In New York City, where I live and where I'm speaking from today, several large hospital systems suddenly decided against New York State and World Health Organization guidelines that pregnant women could not be accompanied during labor and delivery, not even by their husbands, partner, or a doula. This decision affected black women and women of color particularly hard as these women routinely face abuse and neglect during childbirth in U.S. hospitals. And, that, and they are the most in need of support and of an advocate at the time of delivery. Women and girls experience also a loss of access to other reproductive health services, such as contraception, as clinics closed and shortages of drugs and equipment became evident. Meanwhile, right-wing lawmakers in Poland, in Brazil, in the United States, and in other countries seized on the pandemic as a pretext to declare abortion and gender-affirming affir care as non-essential or elective services, in effect banning these critical services during the pandemic. And all of this took place in a context, as has been noted, of school, daycare and elder care closures, which place the staggering additional responsibility and burden of care disproportionately on women worldwide. Now, I don't want to suggest that these phenomena are unique to the COVID-19 outbreak. Existing inequalities and policies of discrimination are often exacerbated during crises with widespread and severe consequences for marginalized women and girls. We saw this, for example, during the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, when sexual and reproductive health and rights were sidelined during the response, and many women died not of Ebola, 
but of maternal conditions. We saw this during the 2015-2016 Zika crisis, when Brazil's draconian restrictions on abortion and the low access to contraceptives in the poorest areas of the country severely harmed and endangered poor black and brown Brazilian women. This ongoing tragedy makes clear the urgent need to reimagine completely our approach to healthcare and especially sexual and reproductive healthcare. It's well past time for all decision makers, such as yourselves, to adopt and implement policies that will immediately empower women and girls to take greater control of their health care and improve access to critical services in the long term. Feminists worldwide sprang into action as soon as COVID emerged. Because of their roots in their communities, they quickly recognized the scope of the crisis, the need for quick action, as well as a clear set of broader demands. In Poland, for example, when the conservative government wasted no time in attacking sexual and reproductive rights, yet again, Polish, Polish feminists quickly mobilized against two draconian bills to ban abortion and sexuality education. Now, while there, this fight is far from over, the feminists of Poland forced the tabling of the bills for the time being. In the process, they showcased the power of feminist organizing and of innovative protest techniques. They blocked the main roundabout in Warsaw with car protests, and they engaged in social media blitzes, which dominated the media space. Similar tactics were used by feminists and other organizers in Brazil, in South Africa, and around the world to stop immediate harm. To articulate the feminist vision for our post-COVID world, a coalition of over 300 organizations, including IWHC, organized online and developed a document entitled The Feminist Response to COVID. It now has its own website, Feminist Response to COVID. I urge you to take a look. It outlines the bold policies we need, and it also documents the efforts of feminists worldwide to hold their own governments accountable. This is complemented by the pre-COVID Feminist Declaration, an agenda for gender justice that was developed by more than 200 organizations worldwide and which includes detailed policy proposal for a more just and equal world. The policies suggested aren't new, but they are more urgent than ever. The feminist movement has for a long time advocated for financing and supporting of quality childcare and elder care. This is especially critical for the domestic workers, women of color and immigrant women who do this work in often appalling and insecure conditions in many parts of the world, including in the OSCE. We ask for sufficient services and financial support for survivors of gender-based violence as an integral part of the COVID response and of permanent social services, not as an afterthought. We demand that contraceptives and abortion pills be available over the counter and that countries allow telemedicine to counsel people on contraception and abortion as well as for other health needs. We demand that healthcare workers, the vast majority of whom are women, be paid equally, that they be free of abuse and harassment at work, that they enjoy decent work conditions, including effective protection against the virus, and that they be promoted to the positions of leadership they so obviously have already earned. We demand an immediate end to police violence and the reallocation of funding from policing to community self-support and investment. Reproductive justice demands that. I want to note in closing that many of these demands of the women's movement are supported by international agreements and guidance on women's rights and sexual and reproductive health and rights from the Cairo Program of Action of 1994 to the Beijing Platform for Action of 1995 to the 2015 Sustainable Development Goals and beyond. Two weeks ago, the World Health Organization issued a fantastic guidance on maintaining health services during COVID. It urges government to expand access to telemedicine, to declare abortion an essential service, and to ensure that patients' human rights <clears throat> are not undermined by the crisis response. So I urge all of you to heed the call of feminists and other social justice activists in your country. They've done the work. They've outlined the needs, the concerns, the priorities, and the solution. 
In addressing our current crisis, we must prioritize the rights of women, girls, and marginalized communities, and we must set ourselves on the path to an equal and just society. The COVID crisis has caused and will cause severe pain and loss. But let us work together to ensure it can also be the beginning of a better, fairer, and more peaceful world for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Vera. Thank you very much. I would like also to thank again all the speakers for sharing their expert views with us. I now open the debate. Uh, the list of speakers will close in two minutes, just two minutes left. And I appeal to all the speakers to kindly limit your remarks to three minutes and to clearly and slowly speak into your microphones to help our interpreters and to conclude no later than when you hear the gong. Uh, the first speaker will be Representative Gwen Moore from the United States of America. Representative Moore, you have the floor. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I first want to thank Dr. Fry uh, for leading this really important discussion and for keeping gender uh, gender issues on our agenda over the years. I want to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Gisela Todir uh, also for her excellent remarks. Uh, the COVID pandemic, of course, has presented enormous health and economic challenges to OSCE participating states. Uh, I am not uh, proud of the fact that the United States seems to be hitting the list of COVID effective deaths from this outbreak. It's a tragic milestone for our country and we mourn for each and every life and are praying for their grieving families. Every family has been affected by it, but of course we have seen once again that uh, minorities uh, uh, have been more affected than any other group uh, here in the United States. African Americans are 2.4% uh, more likely uh, to be afflicted with COVID and tragically to die. Uh, Latinx folks, non-white uh, Hispanics are twice as likely to be afflicted with it. And of course, women with lower uh, economic uh, income jobs, uh, working in nursing homes, uh, the majority of uh, women working in nursing home services are women. So there is that greater disproportionate impact. We also see it being used in domestic violence. Men perpetrators coming home after not socially distancing and using spit as a weapon. So I yield back uh, as I see you nodding your heads. I know that longstanding inequities are at the heart of why women and other groups are more impacted by the pandemic. I've been asked, is the pandemic racist? No, it's opportunistic and it takes advantage of the most vulnerable and women are among that. And I yield back. Thank you very much, Representative Moore. Thank you so much. Um, men are also engaged in this and so I'm very pleased to uh, announce uh, that uh, the next speaker is gonna be a man. I also thank you all uh, those that are making comments in the chat, uh, we take note of the points raised and we appreciate them very much. Uh, next on the list is Mr. Roger Padreni Carmona from Andorra. You have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I am Roger Padreni, MP and member of the delegation of Andorra. During the first five months of 2020, in my country, Andorra, cases of gender-based violence have increased by 60%, worrying figures that have worsened during confinement. These figures demonstrate that gender-based violence exists in homes and that it is structural. We cannot let it continue this way. We cannot let women to be abused by their partners simply because they are women. We cannot allow that. While we are confined and most of us create our coronavirus-free space at home, these women are locked in their own prison forced to live or rather to survive with the aggressor. For this reason, and because we will not stop gender violence by putting on a mask or a vaccine, it's necessary for the state to take part in the fight. Because gender-based violence does not end with the prosecution of the aggressor, this ends with a profound change in the ethereal patriarchal society in which we live. That's why our parliamentary group, the Social Democrat, has asked our government to be responsible, subsidiary, and to compensate victims of gender-based violence. Therefore, we oppose the reservation on Article 30.2 of the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women, known as the 
mentioned. We consider it this way because as long as gender-based violence is not eliminated, it's necessary to make a positive discrimination towards the victims and for the state to act if needed. Otherwise, this profound change must come from the political unity of all parliamentary forces and also extra parliamentary forces, as well as from the social and economic components of every society. In short, all actors in society must be part of it. The latest data in our country and in another member states of the OCPA show that it's necessary to reach state level agreements against gender violence. But while we make this possible and we will greater support, short term aid is also needed to support all women who live in their day to day in permanent violence. Socioeconomic and more institutional support from all administrations, from local to national, including the legislative and judicial branches, are needed. We have many goals, I think, as a society and as all the societies that are part of the OCPA member states. More poly policies that aim to address the problem at its roots, and that include a gender perspective, are needed. We must create more social awareness campaigns on gender-based violence, where the focus of the problem is the abuser and not the abused person. We must educate our children regarding equality and also co-responsibility. We have to promote realistic campaigns for teenagers because, ladies and gentlemen, the reality is harsh. We must reach all areas of society because no one escaped gender case uh, violence. We must listen to women in order to build together a world free of gender based violence. Let's not wait for another pandemic to remind us that the problem exists and that is structural. Let's not wait for another pandemic to act. Let's do it now if we can. And I think that we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Carmona. I agree with you. Let's not wait for the next pandemic, the next crisis, that's clear. Now uh, the floor goes to Mrs. Patricia Bove from Canada. You have the floor, Mrs. Bove. Whoops. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear and see me. Um, thank you, Dr. Fry. Yes, for we can. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fry, for hosting this important, timely webinar on the gendered impacts of COVID-19. One example of your many efforts advancing gender equality in the OSCE region, the Special Representative on Gender Issues for the past 10 years. As Dr. Fry and other esteemed speakers have said today, the COVID-19 pandemic risks undermining and rolling back many recent gains on gender equality. It is incumbent on all participating states to act now to ensure this does not happen any more than it has. No country is immune from the gendered impacts of COVID-19. And in Canada, we've heard that gender-based that gender violence appears to be on the rise. Women, particularly younger women, are more likely to have lost employment than men. And women are far more likely to be working on the front lines in health care and social assistance. While the virus has killed more men than women worldwide, that's not true in Canada. 57% of the de reported cases and 54% of deaths here in Canada are women. Perhaps because they are the largest majority of residents in Canada's long-term care homes, and perhaps because they are the ones on the front lines. Other groups in Canada face disproportionately structured inequalities enhanced by COVID-2. The Indigenous communities facing numerous barriers to health and safety, declining infrastructure, overcrowding, and um, uh, in inadequate housing conditions. Also, the same is true of our Arctic and those living in remote and isolated communities. Canada does not yet track race or ethnicity, in its COVID-19 data. So we are not yet able to understand how black and other racialized communities are impacted by the pandemic. We all, as Dr. Fry has said, must ensure COVID-19 data is not only disaggregated by sex, but also by these intersectional factors. The government of Canada is supporting women up to $50 million to women's shelters and sexual assault centers during the pandemic and is committed to $15 million in additional funding to support women entrepreneurs. I'm going to conclude with a question to Dr. Fry, if I may. As stated in your report, 
for a pandemic response to be successful, diverse women must be brought to the policy making table. How can states best incorporate diverse women's voices in their pandemic response with a focus to those who are typically marginalized? Thank you, and I look forward to our continuing discussion. Thank you very much, Mrs. Boves. That was our question for Dr. Fry. I suggest that we come back to the questions at the very end, so we have to move uh, to move on with our list Absolutely. of speakers. Absolutely. Please, please note that the next intervention will be in Russian. So, uh, please have your Interprefy app ready now uh, to listen to the interpretation if you need it. And uh, I would also like to bring your attention. There was a question in the chat from Mrs. Ratanzani. Uh, from Canada, can the delegates who have presented and uh, please provide concrete steps they and their government has taken during the, this pandemic to provide economic and physical security to the vulnerable, especially women? I know you can see it, but I just wanted to uh, tell this to you or to mention it. So now the, I give the floor to Mrs. Vetlana uh, Lubetskaya from Belarus. You have the floor. Пожалуйста. Уважаемые участники встречи, позвольте поприветствовать вас и поблагодарить за приглашение и проведение такого важного мероприятия от э, женщин-депутатов э, парламента Республики Беларусь. Кстати, вот сейчас э, я беседую с вами со своего рабочего места и хочу отметить, что мы ведем напряженную работу, женщины-депутаты и моя коллега, над тем, чтобы э, работать в части совершенствования законодательства по защите такой социально уязвимой категории, как женщины. Коронавирус обострил те проблемы и ту социальную нагрузку, которую всегда несли женщины. И поэтому сейчас очень важно своевременно и очень разумно и взвешенно проработать все направления поддержки женщин. Мы на сегодняшний день хотели бы поделиться своим маленьким опытом, который за это время наработан, и я его поддерживаю и как женщина-депутат, и как в прошлом судья Верховного суда, я юрист, и считаю, что эти направления деятельности очень важны. В первую очередь, Я бы хотела сказать о поддержке женщин-руководителей, которые сейчас принимают очень важные решения. В Республике Беларусь это более 50% руководителей женщин. Второе направление – это поддержка женщин-медиков. В Республике Беларусь более 85% женщин – это медики. 80% женщин в образовании – это тоже те, кто сегодня работает и в учебных заведениях, и с детьми. И на сегодняшний день я, как юрист, считаю правильным те меры, которые принимает наше правительство по поддержке, по специальным доплатам женщинам-медикам, по первоочередному обеспечению их коммерческим жильем, по выплате специальных пособий в случае заболеваний ребенка от коронавируса. И э, я бы хотела сказать, что парламент женщин – это сегодня 40% представлен в Республике Беларусь. И такая активная позиция, я думаю, что она будет иметь свой эффект. Я очень поддерживаю тех выступающих, которые передо мной высказывались о важности лидерства женщин, поскольку, как никто, они знают самые важные проблемы от бытовых до государственных проблем. И э, сегодня мы говорим о том, что есть вопросы и с воспитанием детей, и с обращением за судебной защитой, э, то я бы хотела отметить такие очень положительные процессы, которые происходят в, э, в сфере обеспечения прав женщин. Это бесплатные юридические консультации нотариусов, адвокатов, для того, чтобы женщины имели и сейчас находясь в социальной изоляции, получать квалифицированную юридическую помощь, естественно, с соблюдением социальной дистанции. Я полагаю, что сегодняшнее мероприятие очень важно, оно очень информативно, и тот опыт, которым делятся все выступающие, для нас будет очень полезен. Благодарю за внимание и желаю всем крепкого здоровья. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, greetings to all of you in Minsk. And now we move to uh, the Caucasus with Mrs. Amina Agazada from Azerbaijan. Thank you. I appreciate it to be here and participate in this important discussion. COVID-19 has effectively set back the gender equality agenda by 50 years, casting a spotlight on the dire 
circumstances a policy of isolation and confinement has led to for women. Azerbaijan was one of the 146 countries who partnered in the UN Security General's rally on gender-based violence amidst the coronavirus pandemic, and now all of our governments must work to create a policy that mitigates the ramification of the current crisis. I believe the European Union UN Spotlight Initiative is crucial to our response. Uh, now is the time to call on more stakeholders, including private and civil society members within our individual countries, to scale up investments while ensuring regularity in service provision and to keep offering support and protection to women and girls at risk of violence. Therefore, it's important to secure the funding to ensure our global intervention can provide the skills, jobs, dignity and protection women so desperately require help and safeguard to stabilize their standing in society. COVID-19 has showed us that its impacts are not only determined by health relative differences, but social norms also affect the health of women and men differently, in particular in male dominated decision-making environments. In this context, while scaling up our efforts to support women in such critical time, we also need to pay attention for the representation of women in health governance, decision making, and certain occupation could help to ensure that uh, women also have an opportunity to shape important healthcare decisions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I turn to uh, our OSCPA Vice President from Sweden, Mrs. Margar Margareta Sederfeld. Mrs. Sederfeld, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fry, for arranging this webinar. I think it's a very important issue, and I would also like to congratulate you for your important work, your special representative, on gender in OSCE PA, where you always highlight what you say uh, with the facts, with the statistic. And I think that work is very important. And just as you said here, when it comes to COVID-19 and the women's situation and representatives, it needs to be, uh, what do I say, pictured by the statistic uh, to have the fact. And, uh, we have noticed as well in Sweden as elsewhere in the world that uh, there is an increased level of domestic violence during the COVID-19. And uh, as said here earlier, it might be a long period for the pandemic and it means that we need to act now and not wait for the next time. Uh, and I would therefore like to hear some uh, thoughts from the distinguished pa panel. What you think is very important for us as politicians to think on when it comes to prevent uh, the domestic violence and prevent it from being worse than it is today. And I'm also thinking about the next uh, pandemic or the ne next uh, situation where we will have this kind of uh, isolation with uh, tra a tragedy, something uh, important happened uh, that uh, affect our society in a negative way and as well uh, limited women and uh, make it uh, more problematic for them to be visible and uh, as well to be uh, what you say to be accepted and not get the uh, victim for the domestic violence. But what I also would like to say is to those women who are affected and a, a victim for the domestic violence, I think it's very important to not shame, not blame them, to support them the whole way during the legal system. So 
it could be a case for the court. And those who abuse them, who uh, use the violence, they should as well be uh, go to court and be uh, a case for the legislative system. And I think this is very important because it shows that the society doesn't accept domestic violence. It shows as well other women that this is what can happen. You shouldn't accept any, any violence at all. And it also shows for those men that if you do anything that's not legal, you will go to, to court and maybe end up in Yale. And this is one part I see as important and where we as the legislator could have a huge impact and take uh, more steps forward to support women. But thank you very much for the floor and continue good work both uh, for Dr. Heidi Fry as well as uh, our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice President Sederfeld. Thank you so much. Now the floor to Mr. Recep Akdag from Turkey. Mr. Akdag, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, good afternoon for all. We all know that pandemics affect all individuals in the society without discrimination. However, some groups, such as women and girls, are particularly vulnerable. Not only these existing inequalities for women and girls, but also reinforce discrimination against other groups, such as people with disabilities and extreme poor. Our country attaches special importance to the protection of the rights of women, children, the elderly, the disabled, and the refugees. In times of big crisis, the risk of exposure to violence and other forms of domestic violence against women and girls may increase. In such periods, special measures should be taken to protect them. Turkey is paying special attention to these subjects. Our efforts to provide uninterrupted services for victims of violence continue in cooperation with violence prevention and monitoring centers, social service centers, and women's guest houses located across the country. Guidance, support, and orientation practices are carried out in coordination with related parties. A special social support line provides free 24-7 service as a psychological, legal, and economic information hotline. The women's support system has been developed in order to provide a and rapid intervention for the victims. The amount for conditional health aid, conditional pregnancy, conditional maternity aid, and aid program for widowed women were increased. As previous speakers have stated, women globally make up over 70% of the workers in the health and social services sectors. According to the International Council of Nurses' recent statement, more than 600 nurses worldwide died from COVID-19, unfortunately. This is just an estimation. Real figures are unknown and insufficient transparency and lack of accurate data leads to a serious underestimation of the infection and death rate among health persons globally. Healthcare workers are risking their lives to protect others and would all have an obligation to keep them safe. They deserve that. I want to conclude by underlining the significance of international solidarity. We have stood with international community so far. Turkey has assisted 125 countries by dispatching of essential medical supplies and personal protective equipment, and we will continue to do so. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Agdag. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mr. Jerry Batimer from Ireland. The floor is yours. Thank Thank you very much, Mark. And um, can I commend Dr. Fry for her coordination of today's meeting? And if ever the Parliamentary Assembly is to have value, then the work of Dr. Fry in today's webinar illustrates that we have to play a key role in the future. Um, can I just say from a, an Irish perspective here, we have done a number of things in, in regarding the issue of domestic violence. We've made rent supplement more accessible to victims of domestic violence where we've seen in the pandemic a 25% increase in calls uh, to helplines regarding domestic violence. In addition, um, we've seen uh, our police force operating a, a targeted campaign where we've seen 107 prosecutions in a two week period. But distressingly, it is the 25% increase in calls 
it's the most worrying part of what we've seen in this uh, pandemic. As a, from a governmental point of view, we've we've allocated one hundred and sixty thousand euros uh, to the, a new ca uh, campaign of awareness. Um, and I think today's webinar, uh, Chairman and and uh, President, is one that we should disseminate to all parliamentarians because it is critical. In addition, if I may, in terms of LG LGBTI, uh, or our youth organisation here in Ireland belong to had a webinar last week for us as parliamentarians where 93% of young LGBTI people felt vulnerable with 42% feeling not acceptable or not accepted or welcome in their own home. So you can imagine in a pandemic that sense of isolation and feeling. Um, in regarding vulnerable women, 8,000 contacts have been made by a police force. Um, and if we're, to, if we're to build an inclusive society, then we must create safe space. We must empower women uh, to be able to reach out for help uh, and, and it's important that, that from today we say it no longer can be a hidden crime. Um, could I also, Chairperson and President and Secretary General, address the remarks of the Polish President, uh, where he tried to, where last week he engaged in homophobic language and behaviour, telling us that we, LGBTI people, that they're trying to convince us that we are human beings, uh, and they said that we're not, but just an ideology. Um, the use of homophobic rhetoric uh, to mobilise one's base in an election campaign is unacceptable, in my opinion. And I would hope that the USE Parliamentary Assembly can take a stance on this. In addition, the decision by the United States around gender recognition to revoke some of President Obama's protections for transgender people uh, is absolutely one that we should condemn out of hand. Enforcement uh, of the sexual discrimination uh, protections uh, is not good enough. Uh, we must, rather than narrow, we must broaden uh, our understanding of gender. Uh, and I do hope that we can take a stance here uh, as a parliamentary assembly. And finally, uh, Chairman, I'm a member here in Ireland in Cork City, where I'm from, uh, of our policing forum. And I'm proud to say that we've had a pilot uh, of a protective services unit established to protect vulnerable women from sexual attack uh, and from sexual use and around domestic violence. Uh, and in the two years, it has gone from being a pilot in Cork and Dublin to being one unfurled and unrolled around the country. And that's positive. And that's headed up by a police inspector with two detective guys, policemen and 10 detectives. So it is about policing vulnerable people. It is about empowering women. But can I again thank Dr. Fry? She makes the USE worthwhile. Her work is there for us all to support the advocate and it's not about just words it's about actions but thank you for today thank you very much and now the floor goes to mrs maria karapetian from armenia maria the floor is yours thank you thank you mark can you hear me Yes, now we can hear you, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, um, I want to thank all OEC colleagues and especially Dr. Fry for the, this webinar and the choice of the theme. Um, my intervention will basically reiterate some of the points that um, the previous speakers have touched upon, but I believe it's important that we uh, bring um, these country-specific experiences to confirm uh, the more uh, theoretical um, analysis that um, uh, has been offered for our consideration. Um, I will start by, uh, by repeating the point that the pandemic does exacerbate uh, the problems that already exist in some form or another form within our societies. And uh, for sure, some of these problems do have a gender dimension, as, and this uh, gender dimension also gets exacerbated uh, with the pandemic, uh, be it the problem of informal workers, unregistered workers, and the big percentage of uh, women within uh, this group in the society, be it domestic violence. Um, but at the same time, the pandemic is also a big equalizer, like any other crisis. Uh, it can also be treated as an opportunity because societies have to mobilize all their resources to take on the challenge. 
So it also presents an opportunity uh, for all of us. Uh, women uh, in Armenia have stepped in in the medical sector as um, volunteer doctors, as paid doctors. Uh, women have stepped into the educational system with its own challenges of um, um, distance learning in times of the uh, lockdown period, especially. Um, Obviously, the, uh, the domestic violence does remain um, uh, a big issue and it does get exacerbated because of the pandemic, because it puts a lot of uh, pressure on uh, the relations in the families uh, uh, and in the domestic context. Uh, and also because uh, during the uh, lockdown period, uh, kindergartens and schools are closed and um, hence uh, there is more um, household chores to be done and distributed within this families so it does create um, additional pressure um, but as I said I believe that the pandemic can be treated also as an opportunity the pressure put on our systems can also be treated as um, an opportunity to increase their resilience also um, as has already been said there might be more similar uh, types of crises uh, that humanity will face. And it's important that we uh, use this as a learning experience as well. Perhaps it's a bit too early to draw our lessons, but, uh, but um, uh, it, it should be within our vision to treat this as a uh, learning experience. Um, um, our, the Armenian government has implemented um, about two dozen social programs, and one of them specifically uh, targeted pregnant women uh, as a group in the society, taking into consideration uh, their uh, their experience of uh, the period of the pandemic. And um, we're, we're also uh, continuing to uh, think in this direction of how uh, these uh, subsidiary programs can, um, uh, can, can be more targeted and geared uh, to the needs of the women. I'll conclude here and once again, thank you for this webinar. Thank you very much, Maya. The next intervention will be in Russian uh, by Mrs. Marina Levchenskaya from Belarus. You have the floor. Добрый день. Прежде всего я хочу поблагодарить организаторов за хорошо и прекрасно организованный семинар. Все, было, все доклады были интересными, обстоятельными, полезными. Я надеюсь, что этот опыт пригодится каждому из нас в нашей дальнейшей деятельности. Со своей стороны мне бы хотелось поделиться опытом Белоруссии о тех мерах, которые принимаются у нас для профилактики домашнего насилия. Мы сегодня много об этом говорим. Сегодня, проанализировав цифры, мы можем констатировать, что в нашем государстве ситуация с домашним насилием находится под контролем. И благодаря выработанной годами предупреждающей системе нам удалось не допустить агрессивного роста преступлений, связанных с домашним насилием. Что делается у нас? Во-первых, это целенаправленная последовательная работа, которая направлена на минимизацию рисков попадания в ситуацию насилия. Прежде всего, это социально-экономические меры поддержки семьи. Моя коллега уже говорила о том, что у нас принято ряд э, таких прогрессивных и очень эффективных мер – как, например, женщина, которая сегодня вынуждена сидеть своим ребенком в самоизоляции, если даже ребенок является контактом первого уровня, получает специальное пособие. Я считаю, что это достаточно эффективная и прогрессивная мера. Второе. У нас очень четко проводится информационно-разъяснительная работа. Сегодня женщины в Беларуси знают, что если они столкнутся с домашним насилием, они прекрасно понимают алгоритм действий, куда идти и к кому обращаться. Несмотря на то, что действительно была серьезная такая ситуация с пандемией, мы не закрывали кризисные комнаты. По всей стране у нас работает 136 таких комнат. Эти комнаты востребованы, женщины приходят туда за помощью. И, конечно же, бесплатные юридические консультации. Да, в условиях пандемии мы, конечно, перевели их в формат соблюдения меры безопасности. Это дистанционный формат. Но, тем не менее, наши женщины обращаются. Еще раз подчеркну, все эти меры привели к тому, что нам все-таки не, ну, не, не довели мы к 
доехать, конечно, до каких-то таких серьезных цифр эту ситуацию. Кроме того, мне бы хотелось отметить, что у нас сегодня подготовлен закон. Закон, который совершенствует профилактику домашнего насилия. Этот закон уже согласован со всеми государственными органами. Надеюсь, в ближайшее время он будет внесен в парламент, и мы еще над ним, как парламентарии, будем работать. Естественно, как, как женщины. И со стороны, конечно же, женщин. Спасибо, благодарю за внимание. So as many of you, I'm happy to be here talking about um, this important topic and wish it was under different circumstances. And I also would like to express my appreciation for Hedy Price's constructive approach and her ongoing and significant commitment to gender equality issues. Uh, as we all, we all have already discussed, the COVID-19 pandemic is causing widespread concern by posing enormous health, economic, environmental, social and political challenges to the entire human population. It's with deepest regret I have to say that women are more vulnerable if we look at the larger social cultural impacts of the pandemic. Women are at high risk of exposure to coronavirus as they represent 70% of the health and social sector workforce globally. COVID-19 exacerbates disproportionate economic and social impact of this pandemic on women and girls. Unfortunately, women earn less, hold less secure jobs and have less access to social protections. And as a result, this economic downtown disproportionately affect women more than men. While governments and international organizations continue to focus their attention and resources to combat this pandemic, we should not forget to raise our voice regarding an urgent consideration of gender implications of COVID-19. We as uh, parliamentarians should adopt a common strategy on how to combat violence against women and girls in our COVID-19 national response plans as well as to ensure that they have an effective and affordable access to quality health care. In highlighting the gender impact of COVID-19, I'd like to share how women resource centers in Azerbaijan stand strong through the COVID-19 pandemic. These centers were established by the State Committee for Family, Women and Children Affairs of the Republic of Azerbaijan and United Nations Development Program. The main mission, uh, mission of the nine resource centers is to help women to strengthen their uh, entrepreneurial skills and advance their competitiveness in the labor market, empowering them to overcome the many socioeconomic challenges faced by women living in rural areas. In times of coping with the pandemic, women's resource centers have effectively switched to providing trainings online. Organizing regular virtual individual and group uh, psychotherapy sessions is part of the work done by the centers. In the end, uh, in briefly, I'd like to stress once again that protecting women's rights is extremely important for social stability, economic development, peace and development in the societies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for sticking to the time and thank you to all the, picture, the speakers actually for sticking to the time that was allocated. Uh, we will now um, revert uh, back uh, the floor to our uh, speakers, to all the people that were on the agenda for their final remarks. We have 12 minutes to conclude. Uh, we will start with uh, Mrs. Girard, followed by Director Gisla Dottir, then President uh, Cuevas Baron, President Seretelli, and finally Dr. Heidi Fry for the concluding remarks. Uh, Mrs. Girard, if you, you have two minutes. Yes, I want to respond to the question by Ms. Sederfeld about what should we invest in uh, to address the situation of women in this crisis, especially on gender-based violence. Obviously, the investment in shelters, hotlines, including text messaging when women can't be seen to make a call during an emergency, 
needs to happen now and it needs to be a, a consistent investment. We can't ramp up those services in the middle of a crisis. We also need to make sure women are, and their children are giving financial support as they exit from the situation of violence so they don't have to go back uh, where they're going to be at really great risk of, of being killed. We also obviously need to invest in legal support and especially social uh, protection orders uh, so that women uh, can keep the perpetrators at bay. But I want to speak also to the underlying conditions, uh, which is the gender norms that gender-based violence actually serves to uphold. Uh, and, and investing in immediate, immediately in education on gender norms in primary school with boys and girls is critical. If we don't change the way in which boys and girls are socialized uh, around gender norms and the use of violence to enforce gender norms, we're never going to get out of this situation. And finally, uh, as UNFP has noted, we are facing at least 7 million unwanted pregnancies as the result of the COVID situation and the lockdowns. That's a crisis for many women who then face violence at the hands of their partners because of this unwanted pregnancy. So that's why our call for telemedicine, for contraceptives, and for abortion pills. We should be able to counsel women by phone, counsel women by internet, and mail them the, the pills so that they're able to take care of themselves. No need for clinic visits. We know that, that the World Health Organization is clear about that. So let's put that in place now so we don't have to face this again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Director Isla de Thier, how are your concluding remarks? Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you again for, for inviting me. And uh, it was quite interesting to listen to the, to the discussion and uh, interventions from, from the parliamentarians. Uh, I'm, none of these things come, I think, to us, all of us, as a surprise. We know that there is this uh, gender imbalance in, in most countries, and we haven't reached gender equality in any country uh, of the world. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the, when we have some rifts existing before the COVID, they, they uh, widened during the COVID. One of those rifts is this inequality between uh, men and women. And uh, Margareta Setterfeld, my, my friend, mentioned, you know, violence against women and uh, asked what can we do to uh, prevent it and uh, what can we do to, to tackle it? Uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, actually the Istanbul Convention from the Council of Europe provides a good guidance to uh, uh, the participating states of how to deal with it. And those countries that have not Implement, uh, ratified it yet, I think they should, the parliamentarians could push for that to start with. And uh, it, then it's sort of not only a question of ratifying that as a document, but it's really to implement it and to take the measures that are needed to uh, protect women and girls from, from violence and to provide the, the adequate services to those who are victims of violence. I also want to mention one thing, it's a uh, trafficking, because uh, I didn't do that in my opening uh, remarks. This is, of course, a, a very important uh, issue also during the, the pandemic. And I just want to inform you that OTIR and UN Women uh, recently completed two surveys uh, targeting survivors of, of trafficking and also non-governmental anti-trafficking uh, uh, stakeholders, and the purpose was to collect em empirical data to guide the development of both short-term and mid-term policy recommendations to governments to ensure the implementation of human rights, gender-sensitive and victim-centered approach to combating uh, trafficking in human beings. So that is something that we have been uh, working on with UN Women, doing a survey to come up with policy guidelines for governments. And we will, of course, share the results with, with parliamentarians. So I think I'll just stop here and thank you again for, for inviting me. Thank you very much, Director. Now the floor goes to President Cuevas Baron. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that all these comments and different uh, approaches to gender issues during the COVID pandemic are 
showing that the most important challenges or even highly unfair situations are coming from a long time ago. I think that we need to learn the lessons that uh, COVID-19 and this pandemic are giving to us. First, that women are absolutely needed. When we say about essential workers, it is clear that it's about women, but about being essential. And I think that that's the reason why we need to uh, redouble and to recommit with, uh, with gender best practices, best legislation. When we are addressing SDGs, the development agenda, we say leave no one behind. But what is behind this very important statement is the parliamentary responsibility. There is no way to achieve these international goals, these international agreements, if they are not translated to real uh, practices, to real solutions at national and, and local level. That means that we need to take a look to review all pieces of legislation. Even the most uh, developed and equal countries are having unequal legislation. There are countries where women, for example, are forced by law to go to work with makeup and high heels and they cannot uh, use uh, glasses. And those are developed countries. So we need to take a look to all different expressions of inequality in legislation to understand that, that it is not only to uh, consider women, it is about prioritizing women and girls because we need to build a, a different uh, perspective. Uh, only to give you a, a, a very significant number and I uh, will respect the time, but when we see that only 24% of the seats in parliament are for women, well, that says a lot because while some countries about only, I think it was four, are having parity in their parliament composition, there are some other parliaments that are having zero or only one uh, female parliamentarian. So if we are not having equal representation, we are not having equal decisions and inclusions. So that's one of the lessons we need to learn. We have to prioritize women and girls now and later. So thank you very much uh, for organizing this uh, interesting dialogue. And I really hope that we continue working together. I, I really admire what you're doing at the OSCE. I think that this uh, election observation, gender issues are fantastic. So thank you, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you. We have a little bit, uh, a few minutes left. President Seretelli, perhaps just a, a concluding word before uh, I give the floor to Dr. Heidi Fry to conclude, to conclude this event. Well, so on this topic, we could uh, uh, debate a lot, even much more longer than we did today, but thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your very precise comments and very interesting ideas. Also, um, uh, it's important to refresh our knowledge and to exchange the practices that we heard from different countries. Um, we all know well that uh, COVID infection and the pandemic brought a lot of burden on, on gender equality. And there were many examples in many directions. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be economic impact, or it wouldn't be gender-based violence, or, uh, or, or services uh, which, which are burdened. Because we now, I think, all the politicians who are at the screen, they are also participating in budgetary uh, discussions. And we see that how, for instance, different competing fields are getting uh, or, or uh, taking money from different services allocated to, for instance, the sexual and reproductive. But Haiti mentioned, and many, as Gerard mentioned, and all of you mentioned. And we have to understand that, especially in low and uh, middle income countries, it will increase dramatically maternal health deaths and, and, and uh, infant deaths and a lot of tragedies. So, we politicians, uh, I think, uh, have to be very active in this direction. We try to keep all the norms and gender norms and gender 
rules, you know, uh, equal and fair. That's uh, very important. And also to, to strive for better budgets, for better services, and we understand that. So great to have these recommendations, advices, but uh, our duty is to make decisions. And I'm very happy that I see all this great audience here who for sure will make very right decisions in coming months or weeks. So uh, uh, thank you very much again for all of you, especially our guests, Heidi, dear Heidi. And uh, we have only one wish at the end of this webinar to see each other in person. Also. So thank you very much again. And thanks our our secretary for organizing. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Please, uh, dear participants, bear two, three minutes over time. Uh, I will now end the floor for the final and concluding remark by Dr. Heidi Fry. So before doing so, I thank already all the participants and especially uh, the Canadian Parliament and uh, all the OSCPA staff colleagues and uh, particularly Deputy Secretary General Gustavo Pallares, who has been supporting this event. Dr. Fry, please, uh, the floor is yours for the conclusion of this event. An excellent moderator. Uh, thank you, everyone, who has come on at short notice and gave us this the, the sort of excellent uh, information that we need to be able to look at this issue. I, I wanted to I wanted to highlight a few things. Gender budgets. I remember Canada as a de as the head of the delegation when we went to Beijing. We brought up about the issue of gender budgets, but many many parliaments. Very few of them actually have gender budgets, and I think it's something we should talk about. Uh, I think we need to get more women into politics. It's obviously, uh, we heard Gabriela saying this, we need to ensure that there are more women's voices there. I think um, we still found out the issue of domestic violence has been dealt with. Patricia Covey asked a question about that. Uh, and so did a lot of people, Margareta. And I think we've had answers. I won't go over the things that other, <clears throat> other people have said because we don't have a lot of time. But I wanted to highlight that if we don't look at getting sex disaggregated data, if we do not look at getting our data on the intersectionality, we will lose the fact that while women are vulnerable during COVID-19, there are some women that are more vulnerable than others, sex workers, undocumented workers, foreign migrant workers, we're finding that they are extremely vulnerable. I think we need to look at the women's rights to sexual and reproductive health. These things have been forgotten in this crisis. I think the other thing is I want to thank Jerry. I don't know if he's still there from Ireland, but bringing up the issue of LGBTQ2 plus rights. These are of core issues because these women are invisible and these people have become invisible in COVID-19. Many of them have no access to any help at all for rent and for food. And so what we need to do is ensure we get more women there. And I don't know that having more women in Parliament is the only solution to making the right decisions. We have to have learned from COVID. We need to pick up all the data we have from this COVID-19, and we need to rebuild strong institutions for social, economic, uh, education, and all of those areas in which women and men who are still vulnerable we need to be able to build into those those new uh institutions we need to be able to build that equality that fairness the ability to pay attention and do it we have an opportunity right now let's not go back to the old ways let's get our parliaments to go back and start fighting for doing things very very differently i hope you will all do that as parliamentarians and i want to thank Gabriele, Inky Bjorg, uh, Francoise, uh, for being here and for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you very, very much. Bye. And thanks, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Just asked uh, all the colleagues who have been supporting the, the, the webinar to, to come. And, uh, thank, thank you, you very everyone. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Raul. Fantastic job. Congratulations, Raul. Very professional. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Much. Bye, Heidi. Bye, my love. Take care, all of you. And George. Okay. Bye. Bye, Heidi. Thank you, Margaret. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hi, everyone. Thanks for everything, buddy. And thanks to the USCP. Okay, to check on our rendering. Thank you very much. Thank you. Спасибо большое, Миск. Спасибо, Беларусь. Вижу, Карсенко.